Liberalism section. Delimitation of the sacred space and theorization of a planetary dictatorship. By rigorously delimiting the sacred space, liberalism radically widened the gulf separating it from the profane space. The element of regression in this is clear. A comparison will suffice to account for it. In the most exalted texts of its culture, Europe long strove to maintain a lucid and self-critical view of itself, refusing to allow itself to be intoxicated and carried away by euphoria on account of the irresistible march begun with the discovery conquest of America. And this approach continued to display its vitality in the Enlightenment and the culture that became part of the inheritance of French radicalism. Let us read Raynal and Diderot, quote, The Conquistadors, first steps were marked by rivers of blood. In the inebriation of their success, they took the decision to exterminate those they had robbed. Countless people vanished from the face of the earth on the arrival of these barbarians, who took to treating the brothers they had just discovered without remorse, as they treated the wild beasts of the old hemisphere. End quote. Denunciation of the extermination of the Indians was rounded off with condemnation of the trade in slaves called upon to replace them as labor. In any event, it was not only in the New World that the, quote, European barbarians stained themselves with genocide. The, quote, unhappy Hottentots likewise suffered a pitiless massacre. In addition to the colonial conquest, Louis Sebastien Mercier drew attention to further dark pages in Europe's history in the second half of the French 18th century. His utopian novel imagined a, quote, singular monument in which the nations represented asked humanity's pardon for the cruelty shown by them. Along with the genocide of the Indians, the expiatory monument recalled forced labor or, quote, the slow torture of so many unfortunates condemned to the mines and the subsequent black slave trade symbolized by numerous mutilated slaves, end quote. Incontestably responsible for all this were the Europeans, also charged with, quote, the atrocity of the Crusades, the horrible St. Bartholomew's Night, and the wars of religion, end quote. By contrast, let us now observe the way Edgar Quinette argues. In 1845, sketching in broad outline the history of the West, the French liberal historian came to the Spanish conquest of America. He could not ignore the extermination of the indigenous populations, but hit upon an explanation that was simultaneously ingenious and reassuring. True, it had been carried out by Spain, a country that was an integral part of the West. But at the time, Spain had experienced a decisive influx of the culture and religion of Islam, which was thus the actual, if indirect, executioner of the Indians. The same line of argument was adopted for other black pages in the West's history. Had not the Inquisition had its center in a Spain widely influenced by barbarians? And as to the crusade that destroyed the Albigensian heretics, without distinction of age and sex, was it not perhaps prepared by the prayers of the Spaniard San Domenico de Guzman? Via Spain, all signs pointed to Islam, at whose door could be laid even the Crusades, which precisely had as their stated target the Muslim infidels. Quinette passed judgment, quote, In the Crusades, the Catholic Church enacted the principle of Islamism, extermination. End quote. But not only Islam was stigmatized as synonymous with barbarism. European high culture had long regarded China with curiosity and interest. Where were the wars of religion that had covered Europe with blood? They were prevented by a religion that shunned mystery and dogma, resolving itself into an ethics. For the philosophes, it was easier to recognize themselves in the mandarins than the Catholic clergy or Protestant ministers. The importance of the role played by a layer of secular intellectuals in the great Asiatic country was confirmed by the fact that the highest administrative public offices 
were often allocated through public competition, rather than being the monopoly, as in France, of a titled aristocracy, allied and intertwined with the clergy. In any event, in China, the secular, modern principle of merit prevailed over the obscurantist principle of privilege based on birth and blood. The Enlightenment's sympathetic attention to non-European cultures, employed as a critical mirror of Europe, became a charge in the indictment drawn up by de Tocqueville. The philosophes had turned for a model to China, quote, that unenlightened barbarian government which lets itself be manipulated at will by a handful of Europeans. End quote. The feudal aristocracy's prevalence in Europe was also the prevalence of bellicose values. While China, observed Leibniz, an author already completely infused with the pathos of the Enlightenment, was distinguished by its aversion to anything that, quote, creates or nourishes ferocity in men, end quote thereby constituting a reference point for philosophes engaged in criticizing the Ancien Regime's privy wars. Thus, the history of the two Indias applauded the Pacific spirit exhibited by Chinese culture. All this became off-key at the moment of the triumph of colonial expansionism. And so, in de Tocqueville, corresponding to the celebration of war as an expression of the nation's grandeur, and an antidote to the socialist movement's vulgar hedonism. We find an intensification of the indictment against China, also reproved for its unwarlike character. The French liberal displayed his contempt for a country whose army enjoyed, quote, peacefully scraping a living, overwhelmed as it was by the, quote, general softness of ideas and desires, end quote. Fortunately, all this facilitated the conquest of China. Quote, it would be difficult for me to console myself if, before dying, I did not see China opened and the eye of Europe penetrate there with its arms. End quote. Now, there was nothing to be learnt from non European civilizations. In 1835, Macaulay declared that quote, a single shelf of a good European library is worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. End quote. Accordingly, we can understand the indifference with which the destruction of the Summer Palace, and all its incomparable beauty, by English and French troops during the Second Opium War, was viewed. Expressing his indignation was Victor Hugo. Quote, we Europeans are the civilized ones, and for us the Chinese are barbarians. And here is what civilization has done to barbarism. In history's eyes, one bandit will be called France, the other will be called England. End quote. Some years later, on the occasion of the Commune, the good liberal Bagoho expressed his contempt for the behavior of the rebels, whom he criticized for having wanted to destroy everything worth seeing and admiring in Paris. Any testament to culture and civilization. Thus was credited the rumor, which subsequently proved unfounded, that the communards had destroyed the Louvre. But no mention was made here of the destruction of the Summer Palace in Peking, which actually occurred roughly ten years earlier, with the decisive participation of the country that, for Bagaho, was the privileged embodiment of the cause of liberty and civilization. Authors like Las Casas and Montaigne had problematized the boundaries between civilization and barbarism, and made them fluid. In this perspective, civilization advanced through exchanges between different cultures. Developing their thinking in the years when missionaries from Christian Europe were received with respect and benevolence in China, while in France, Louis XIV revoked the Edict of Nantes and resumed persecution of the Huguenots, Bale and Leibniz reached a radical conclusion. It was a pity that the relationship between China and European was marked by its one-sidedness. The presence of Chinese missionaries in Europe would definitely be beneficial. Later, Renal and Diderot's history assigned a black Spartacus 
the task of advancing the cause of freedom, breaking the chains of slavery, and putting an end to the barbarism of which Europeans were the agents. But this attempt to cast a glance at Europe, as it were, from without, recognizing the contributions of different cultures to the cause of advancing civilization, did not survive the irresistible march of colonial expansionism. Having triumphed on a planetary scale, the liberal West saw fit to identify itself permanently with the cause of civilization and liberty. On the basis of this absolute and immutable preeminence, we see an exclusive elite, the restricted community of the free, explicitly formulate the claim, hitherto unknown and unheard of, to exercise a planetary dictatorship over the rest of humanity. End section.